Welcome everybody to the Bite Size Canine Anatomy and we're so excited to be back. So I'd like to say a very big welcome from Sarah who's working in the chat. Now if you're new, we've got lots of new people attending as well as lots of people who've attended in the past. Just to orientate you around the page, we've got a chat box on the bottom right of the page. If you want to put your information, say hi, share, share things, you might meet up with someone, connect, please put it in there. If you've got any questions, please put them in the Q&A along the bottom navigation bar so we don't miss them. Because as the um, presentation goes forward, the chat rolls up and we'll miss your questions. Um, if you can just give me a bit of feedback as well, if you can hear me and see me, we've got a live event going on and we will have a replay going out onto our YouTube channel next week. Um, I'm really excited and we're really thrilled um, to be back and we're going to explore the bite-sized canine anatomy. I'm going to call it deltoid muscle because that's how I learned it, but it's deltoidius muscle. Um, we've got a free web page. If you look under the screen, you can see free deltoidus muscle info web page. You can click on that now, have it on your own device, bookmark it. It's a free web page that we give out to the community and it's a living document so we can add and tweak things in. And this is for our live event and our replay, it'll work. Great, thank you for the feedback that you can see and hear me, that's brilliant. So um, anything else, the ask a question, we've also put a poll in. So we want to know what you would like us to cover in the next event. So we put some ideas. So if you would like to vote, your vote will, the one with the most votes is definitely going to be our next presentation. So you are steering what we deliver to you. And I know it's been an incredibly tricky time this last year. So we're going to be committed to delivering these free bite-sized um, canine events. And we can do bite-sized clinical tools and treatment techniques bite size, canine anatomy. So you let us know what you would like. So off we go. And thank you, Sarah, so much. She's going to be steering. I'm really sorry if I, I miss your messages in the chat. I see them later, but I'm just going to tr try and concentrate on delivering the um, presentation. So these kind of events are about sharing and collaboration. And we've designed this, a lot of people ask us the questions, how do I claim my CPD certificate? So I've got some links there. You can claim your CPD certificate that identifies your hours of study, um, which you need for your professional associations and your regulatory bodies and for your own professional development easily. There's a click here. It takes you to an online form and you can fill that out. We have a nominal charge of three pounds to cover it. The actual cost is about £4.60, so we're giving back to the community always. And then what we'll do is we'll upload this webinar replay and we'll stick it into this page so we kind of make a complete resource for you as well. So deltoid, you can call it deltoidius. I'm going to refer it to deltoid muscle. It's an intrinsic muscle. It's found in the thoracic limb, so it's found in the forelimb. So an intrinsic muscle is a muscle where they've got their origin and their insertion within the thoracic limb or the forelimb. So I felt it was really great to have a bit of an anatomy review. I'm going to look at some bony landmarks. So bony landmarks are absolutely invaluable to orientate and accurately locate the structure that you're um, using to find another structure or the structure that you're using to palpate and analyze. And I think it's very important as therapists that we use mindful therapeutic palpation skills. And these are very different to gross palpation skills. And so whatever the dogs breed, coat length, texture, you're going to go in really mindfully to palpate these structures carefully. So we make it a very positive experience for the dog and get valuable, accurate and valid information. So within the um, structure here, you can see we've got, we're going to be looking at the scapula, which is the shoulder blade. And the scapula you can see has got three sides, three angles and it's bisected by the spine of scapula, which is labeled here, the spine of scapula. And at the end of the spine of scapula, we've got the acromion, which is a big knob at the end of the spine of the scapula. 
We've also got the deltoid tuberosity. Now, anatomy is very cool. Usually there's some clues in the name to help you know where to hunt for it. And this is, this. whereas the acromion is like a rounded big knob, the deltoid tuberosity feels when you palpate it like an oval shape, like a mound, a mound um, on the humerus bone here. And so it's just to get yourself orientated because you're never going to go towards deltoid and just fumble around and palpate it because you're canine therapist with high skills. You're going to locate your bony landmarks and go in quietly and carefully so you get really valid information about the muscle tone and the feel of the muscle um, for part of your analysis, evaluation and also for your treatment techniques. So let's look at these structures on the dog. And what I've tried to do is give you a little bit of orientation with some lines. So there's some green lines and we've got the labeling in blue. So the green line, which is the spine of scapula sitting there, you can see the angle in the real dog is slightly different to the skeleton. Remember the skeleton can be quite misleading for where those structures are. Now on a short dog, a shorter legged, small dog, something like a wonderful little Jack Russell Terrier, you're going to find the spinal scapula is much more vertical and much more cranial than you think. So much more forward and much more upright. And that's why they have a choppy gait, which is normal for Jack Russell Terriers, but would be very different for this wonderful Bracco Italiano breed. And you've got your spine of scapula. At the bottom there, we've got the acromion. So it's the knob at the end of the spinal scapula and the spinal scapula comes out at 90 degrees from the shoulder blade, from the scapula itself. There's deltoid tuberosity and a really good clinical tip. If you want to find deltoid tuberosity, you've got your humerus bone there. If you go halfway down, it's always slightly above it. It's always slightly proximal and, and it's on the humerus and bone there, cranial slightly laterally. So that feels like a mound. So I hope that orientates you on, on a real dog, but remember different breeds, different places of angulation. So again, always use considered, mindful, therapeutic palpation, which is totally different to gross palpation skills with pressure. So we've moved on from that. Um, and this is really important as part of your assessment and treatment and also to win that confidence of the dog to work with you and give you their consent. So let's look a little bit closer at the scapula because it's really crucial we understand the parts of the scapula as the deltoid comes from, it arises from the scapula. So these diagrams, hopefully, lots of labeling, so I'm not gonna talk through them, but you can have a look at the page. So all you have to do is go onto that link, bookmark the page, it's a free web page that sits out there always for you to refer back to. So it's really just discussing um, deltoid within this presentation and then for you to go and have a look, look at it and review it if you need to. So again, the scapula has got three angles. It's got a cranial angle, which is a curve. It's got a caudal angle, a little bit harder to palpate. And the caudal border down to the ventral angle here, down at the bottom, the caudal border it feels flatter and flatter towards the costal surface. Whereas the, the round cranial border is very easy to palpate. Another top clinical tip, I tend to use the whole border of the lateral border of my, my hand here, of my little finger to find it rather than using fingertips. It's so much more comfortable for the dog and it kind of tucks in there and it's ideal if you're then going to do a manual technique. So the acromion you can see at the distal end here of the spine of scapula, the spine of scapula sort of dissects, kind of bisects it really and we've got these two huge fossas here and that's the supraspinatus fossa, supraspinous fossa, excuse me, and the infraspinous fossa. And then the most important angle of the scapula, without doubt, is the ventral angle. And that's the glenoid cavity, and that constitutes part of the dog's shoulder joint. So on the um, medial aspect, so we've got, this is the left scapula medial aspect. This is the costal surface of the scapula. We've got this huge subscapular fossa and this kind of serrated area at the top, which is roughened, which another very important muscle attaches to, serratus ventralis. 
And the subscapular fossa, we have put it in the poll. Maybe you'd like to know more about the subscapularis muscle. It's a fascinating muscle and it really makes sense its location and its function. So we're just moving down here. So I want to share a top clinical tip. Hopefully you're seeing this on the screen and you can see it clearly. Um, always palpate using mindful therapeutic touch techniques. And if you want to know more about therapeutic touch, we've got a video on the YouTube exploring therapeutic touch. And it's about assessing, analyzing, and then also applying techniques. We need to really be mindful of the pressures we're using, move away from fingertip pressures and, and gross touch using pressure to locate. And in fact, something I've been saying to everybody for about 20, 25 years, less is more. And it's wonderful to hear that come back to me. So high quality palpation that works with the dog slowly and mindfully gets amazing results. You won't get false positives and it, you'll make it a very positive experience for the dog. So again, just having a little look here, and I wanted you to notice the Y-shaped harness we put on the skeleton. And it's fundamentally really important to therapeutically use the correct Y-shaped harness for each dog and why you wouldn't use another design. And, and we're definitely gonna talk more about this. I'm doing some CAM Lives um, during the week and we're gonna talk that, about that in relation to hydrotherapy. So please do join me for that. It's gonna be very exciting Wednesday night at seven o'clock for all about the equipment and how we're using the equipment currently compared to historically and then and the different equipment that maybe not everybody's appreciating and then on the thursday we're going to have an in-depth discussion about flotation devices and harnesses and, and and analyzing what's best for the dog to get the best results so here again you can see the deltoid tuberosity I'm just marking it there with my pointer, hopefully you can see, is a mound shape. So you're exploring its cranial lateral, not quite lateral, just slightly lateral from the cranial. And when you look at the length of the humerus, cut it in half and it always sits just above. It's a great tip to find it. And when you're palpating, obviously the shoulder here, the shoulder joint lies equidistant just between the acromion and the greater tubercle of the, um, the humerus, it sits in there. And when you palpate that, you'll feel a little dent, like it goes in like a V. So you're literally on the dog's shoulder joint. When you're finding the spine of the scapula, you're going to probably put your fingers on the dorsal border of the scapula and rest it. And a really top tip, when you're finding like a, a line, like the spine or the dorsal border, don't go cranial caudal or proximal distal. Don't go up and down along it. Go across it. Sweep with your hand and you will find it so much more easily. So now what I've done, um, thank you, Sarah, for your great pictures here. I want you to take in your mind the, the scapula off the skeleton and sit it in front of you on the table. So this is a, a aspect where the scapula is lying in front of you. And here's the very important glenoid cavity, which is part of the shoulder joints, the ventral angle of the scapula. And just caudal to it, we've got the infraglenoid tubercle, very important with the triceps and brachii muscle. Again, have a look at your YouTube triceps brachii and review that. And we've also got the supraglenoid tubercle, and that's a little bigger. It's got a very important structure that attaches to that. That's biceps brachii muscle. Again, we've done a really useful bite-sized canine anatomy on the biceps brachii muscle. It sits in the YouTube channel, so do go and have a look. We've got our supraspinous fossa, which sits cranially, infraspinous fossa, both different shapes, which sits cordially. And this is why I wanted this illustration. Can you see the spine of the scapula sits along here and the spine actually arises out of the scapula at 90 degrees. Now we've only got three muscles that actually attach along the spinal scapula, which we're going to talk about shortly. And it's a really good way to kind of analyze, but I've got an amazing fact to share with you about the development of the spine of the scapula. And it's very important related to injuries that we see in big working dogs. So let's think about the lateral scapular muscles. So these are on the 
the, the sort of lateral side, the outside of the scapula, we've got wonderful deltoid. It's superficial. So literally just pick up, think in your mind, take up the skin, take up the fascia, and it's there right underneath. This is what you're palpating. You are not palpating supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles. You are palpating deltoid. And it's superficial and it's really easy to palpate and it's very often missed, misdiagnosed or missed with a muscle injury. It's confused with other muscles. Supraspinatus, supraspinatus muscle lies in that supraspinous fossa and it's deep and it's mainly covered by muscles. And the muscles that cover supraspinatus are trapezius, the cervical fibers of it, and also omotransversarius, which we're going to see because that attaches here. If you can see omotransversarius, we've got three muscles that attach to the spinous scapula. We've got trapezius, which is kind of like a triangle shape there. They're the cervical fibers covering supraspinatus. And we've got omotransversarius, which is a long strap-like muscle. It's superficial there, literally on the caudal part of the spine of the scapula, just cranial to it, and then it dips under brachycephalicus. And then, of course, we've got the magnificent deltoid. So deltoid, the scapular part, is two portions, which we're going to explore in a moment. And then we've got the acromial portion. Together, they make deltoid, and they attach down to that deltoid tuberosity. So there's only three muscles that attach to the spine of the scapula. And looking at the diagrams, you can appreciate which muscles perhaps are going to have a big impact on the development of the spine of scapulas angulation. So we're thinking of the muscle attachments now. And I want to just a quick review on muscle attachments. I know you know this, but it's just so interesting to review it, get a bit more depth because it relates directly to deltoid. We've got skeletal muscle attachments and muscles are attached to bone by connective tissue. And there's lots of different kinds. And you may have a tendon, which is cord-like structure, or you could have a flat sheet-like structure, and that's called an aponeurosis. And it's really important because we've got a very significant aponeurosis on this spine of scapula. And you'll find on different breeds, it's different widths. So that you need your breed knowledge in there as well. So some muscles also will attach directly to the bone or the periosteum of the bone, I should say. And the periosteum of the bone is like a really um, neat covering of the bone and it's very well innovated. And you will know this because when you bashed your shin or your hip bone, there's a lot of pain and that's because you've um, you know, bruised your periosteum and it's really well innovated. And when a muscle attaches like this, it's known as fleshy attachments. So when we're looking at our skeletal muscle origin and insertion, these are our muscle attachments in the limb. The origin is always the more proximal point. This is the fixed point of attachment. Um, and then you're going to have your insertion is always going to be distal to that. And the insertion of the muscle is your movable attachment. Okay, so your more proximal attachment is going to be your origin and your distal attachment is going to be your insertion for muscles in the limb of the dog. So let's get really excited by deltoid. The deltoid muscle has got two main portions. You've got the scapula and the acromial parts and they're both very superficial, literally just lying under the skin and the fascia. You're going to be able to palpate these incredibly easily. So if I just move there, I think you can see that. So the scapular portion of the deltoid is marked in the left diagram and it's covered by the superficial fascia. I'm going to explore all about fascia in the CPD resource library. It's such an exciting structure to know how to identify and apply your amazing manual techniques. It's located between the spine of the scapula, the scapular part, and the proximal half of the humerus, it's huge. It's so often overlooked. So it's such an important muscle to really understand where the guttural fascia, fascias, uh, sorry, the fascial gutterings of the muscle are in relation to triceps. And the acromial part, you can see that in the right-hand picture, the acromial part arises at that bony landmark that we've looked at earlier, the, the acromion, okay? The knob at the end of the spine of the scapula. 
And the um, acromial portion is a fusiform shape. It's kind of an oval flat belly and it crosses the lateral aspect of the dog's shoulder joint. And that, again, a very important fact about some dogs have bursas between this attachment and infraspinatus. So we need to have a look at that as well um, when we're palpating and be aware of that. And a bursa is a synovial sac and it's going to really help with the smooth, efficient movement and um, workings of the muscles with each other. So I'll just bring that up. So I want you to think about both parts of the acromial part and the scapular part. They fuse together, they unite, and they attach part tenderness and part direct muscle attachment. So a fleshy attachment and part tenderness to the bony landmark called the deltoid tuberosity, which we looked at on the previous slides. So I think you can see this. So I wanted to just describe a little bit more depth about the lateral surface of the deltoid muscle. So the surface that you will palpate just under the skin and the fascia. So from the spine of the scapula arises this aponeurosis. And when you look at it on muscle charts, it'll look white and it'll be different widths for different breeds. It provides attachment for muscle fibers or your myofibers. So not only is it um, stiffening the area, adding support, the pull of it is going to actually influence the shape of the spine of the scapula as well, which we'll talk about in the next um, diagram below. But it's also gonna give um, uh, attachment, the fibers arise from it. And this aponeurosis will blend with the deeply placed infraspinatus muscle. So it's going to blend with the infraspinatus muscle behind it and underneath it. And it's gonna cover more than half of the acromial part of deltoid muscle. So it's very important to know where it is. The medial surface, so the surface you can't palpate, the costal surface of the deltoid is both um, of the scapula and the acromial parts of deltoid. This has also got an aponeurosis and it's very thin. It's very thin distally as it attaches. So think of the aponeurosis as like a, an envelope around the letter and deltoid is the letter inside that envelope. But instead of being an envelope that's all joined, it's kind of all connected, but it definitely envelops this muscle. And this is where we need to also consider we see a bursa, which is that synovial um, sac, occasionally between the tendons of the acromial part of deltoid and also um, between that infraspinatus muscle, which is deep. Top clinical tip coming up, we've got to share these. Deltoid muscle injuries are very often misdiagnosed as triceps injuries. So to, to do that, you need to effectively palpate the muscle, find those fascial gutterings that differentiate the edge of it. So understanding where the muscle is, exploring very carefully and mindfully, because quite often in that fascial guttering between the scapula part of deltoid and the lateral head of triceps, you may find a trigger point, you may find um, some damage to the fascial guttering itself as well. Um, and be really mindful not to presume it's a triceps injury because you have a lot of issues along that area. This is about accurately locating and analyzing and evaluating the muscle tissue um, and the edges of the muscle and the fascia around it as well. So again, just being orientated here, we've got latissimus dorsi, that amazing muscle. Again, if you've not really explored that in depth for a while, please take a look at our YouTube channel. We've got latissimus dorsi in depth in there and it's fascinating. Just above it, we've got the um, trapezius, the thoracic fibers, the cervical fibers are missing in this diagram. But this is all about looking at the deltoid muscle, looking at the enormous size of the scapular head, um, the, sorry, the scapular portion of the muscle and then the amazing fusiform, I'll just bring here the pointer, fusiform flat oval muscle and they unite together to attach here on that deltoid tuberosity on the cranial slightly lateral aspect of the humerus. So you know that if you're going to learn about a muscle, we have to know about the innovation because the innovation is what switches it on. 
It's all about what it does. So the brachial plexus, which runs from your um, ventral branches of your spinal nerve, C6 to T2, gives origin to the nerves which supply the forelimb or the thoracic limb. And we know that deltoid is innervated by the axillary nerve, which arises from this brachial plexus. And it comes from the combined C7 and C8 nerves. Uh, C just annotates for cervical. So the nerve root, let's think about the nerve root. It comes out of that axillary space, deep, chordodistal. So it comes out below subscapularis muscle, muscle, kind of sandwiches between the two, and above the teres major muscle. And then it kind of sweeps round more cranially, going into deltoid to innervate it. And the muscle um, is innervated by the axillary nerve. Never learn a muscle and a nerve together singly. So when you're learning your nerves, always learn a group. And I've got a really useful um, kind of like acronym that I use. I call it the DTT nerve. So axillary nerve is the DTT. It innervates deltoid, teres major, and teres minor. And before you know it, you've learned the innovation or you've reviewed the innovation for your shoulder flexors because they work in groups. The cutaneous innovation, I've kind of just been a bit brief here. It's a lot more complicated than this. But it's just a diagram to show you that it's the dorsolateral aspect of the brachium. The brachium is the humerus. So think of that, that area there. And it's the, there's a lot of overlap with other nerves. So actually, clinically, if you damage the axillary nerve, which may happen if there's a tumor or interruption with it, the dog actually clinically, you will see, can move and get around because there's a lot of overlap of other muscles and other nerves in that area. So this is where we need to really think about the action of deltoid. And I've got another clinical tip coming up. So the deltoid is a shoulder flexor. It works as part of the group of shoulder flexors. We've had EMG activity and studies in several speeds in canine motion. And it's all about it flexes the shoulder joint. So don't get confused with shoulder flexion and retraction of the limb. So your forelimb retraction, where the whole limb comes cordially, where it comes backwards, there will be some action of shoulder flexion, but it's not the same action. So shoulder flexion is definitely where the angle between the humerus and the scapula um, is going to get smaller. So the shoulder flexion range of motion is different to the protraction. So it's just sometimes people get a little bit confused with that. And the most important thing is to appreciate that your retraction phase from early stance to mid stance, the mid stance to push off is the power sweep. That's where we generate the movement, the power with the limb working against the ground, pushing in that retraction power sweep phase. So top clinical tip coming up. It's really important to understand the biomechanical influences that we can um, create by putting on equipment or structures or things onto the dog. So when you put that, the sensory, your dermatones, your sensory, your cutaneous, as well as pressure, pick up information on your proprioceptors and send it into the computer. So we can positively influence the postures, the the stance and the movement of a dog by using an appropriate Y-shaped, well-fitted harness um, to influence the dog's natural balance motion. How exciting is that? So it's all about optimizing the dog's movement. Whereas poorly fitted harnesses or harnesses that have a strap that comes along and you can see on the right hand picture here, any kind of harness that comes along here and comes across the humerus is going to definitely interfere with efficient protraction of the limb, which is incredibly important because protraction and flexion is the start of then the retraction phase and the power sweep and movement for the dog. So by choosing the correctly fitted harness, you can influence positively the biomechanical model of the dog and that leads to improved motion. So we're going to explore in depth the wide range of therapeutic uses you can use for the Y-shaped harness for natural balance stance, postures and motion in our canine CPD resource library. So I've had lots of questions about that. People have asked um, 
do I get access just to the current resources? Every single CPD resource is actually an individual CPD event like this. Um, it's got its own moderation and study hours attached to it. So we will take this deltoid presentation and put it into our bite-sized canine anatomy in the library, but we're going to add a lot more detail and loads more videos in it. And that will go in in a few weeks time. Um, but next Sunday, we're exploring in our bite-sized clinical tools and techniques hub, all about the therapeutic uses of the Y-shaped harnesses. But it's a really good um, piece of information to really think about the harnesses that you choose and what you're trying to influence with the dog. So if you want to know more information, you can just click there. And currently, well, after next week, we'll have two more hours. Um, each event is around two hours. We'll have 80 hours of accredited CPD resources for you to choose from. And as I said, we've got free certification for our library members as well. We also will be putting the replay onto the YouTube channel. So thank you, Jane. She's just saying, love the library. It's really innovative. It's really easy to um, find your way around. It's so different. People aren't quite sure what to expect. It's not many courses. This is a library with a huge number of resources that you can pluck out and pop in as a quick reference or plan your study hours. And it's all accredited. So because it's so different, I think people have been a bit like, well, I'm not sure what, what it's all about. It's very easy to find yourself a, around. We got an award for a brilliant innovative design and it uses the same kind of notion pages as I'm presenting with you this evening. So if you want to see the replay, um, you can go on the same link or else you can go onto our YouTube channel in a few days and we'll upload it on there. And the last thing really, just if you found this useful, if you're liking the bite-sized canine anatomy, please, please vote in the poll. Um, the poll is really important because the winner of the poll is gonna be our next presentation. So if you want to influence what we do, check in the poll at the bottom of the page and I'll look at that in a moment to see how many votes we've got and what's kind of leading the way. If you felt this was useful, we would really appreciate for you to pay as you feel a donation and you can buy us a coffee. The coffee's three pounds, you can buy us one coffee, three coffees, and we use all those funds to generate these free CPD events because they take about three or four days and Sarah and I really love putting them together, but they take a lot of time with all the illustrations because we create all of the illustrations ourselves. I hope you find this really useful. Please give me some feedback. We're going to be just checking if we've got any questions in a moment. And um, do give us some feedback in the chat if you'd like some more of these. It's been brilliant delivering the first one for this year and we really look forward to doing some more. So let's just check the poll. So we're gonna leave the poll open and it's gonna run for the replay. So if you want to influence, please, please, please make sure you put your votes in here. And we've got moving votes at the moment. So at the moment, just heading up ahead is the carpus joint, which is really exciting to know all about. So obviously that's the wrist and the dog. Um, and coming in a close second at the moment is infraspinatus and supraspinatus muscles, which is really important as they um, often get overlooked and misunderstood. And I'm gonna do two, two for the price of one in there for that one. Um, and then subscapularis kind of started off strong, but it's faded. So, but it's got a very interesting way it's designed biomechanically that I really want to share with you. Um, and so my last, so just to see if we've got any ask a questions, no questions. So my last tip that I'd really like to just share with you is that your big muscled, strong dogs, I'm just gonna go back on here. Let's go back up to this amazing illustration. And this is a top tip because it really matters your breeds. And that's why we have a breed biology hub from a clinical perspective in the CPD library. I'm there. Thank you for your patience. Right. Think about this muscle that we've just talked about and where it attaches. Big working dogs have a huge pull on the spinous scapula. So as a puppy, the spinous scapula will grow at right angles to the blade, to the scapula itself as it comes up. And as the dog grows a little bit older and has a lot of wonderful activities in the big muscular dogs, there's this huge pull from shoulder flexion on that spine. And actually in real life, the spine curves round caudally. 
So it doesn't come up straight. So in a puppy, it's coming up straight. And in a big working muscle dog or a running dog, you're going to find that the spine actually comes up and curves cordially. And another really important fact for when you're palpating, just bear with me, to the scapula. So, sorry, I've missed the diagrams of the scapula just coming around there. In real life, now in the horse, the horse has got a much bigger one, but in real life, the scapula is actually extended with the scapular cartilage. And this scapular cartilage, what it does is it extends the muscle attachment. And on the dorsal and the medial aspect, that's where rhomboids attaches to. So lots of people are pal palpating, thinking they're on trapezius, but they may, may well be on rhomboidius. So if you want to know about the rhomboid muscles as well, because they're fascinating and very unique for the dog, you know, let, let us know. Send us an email to info at caninehscourses.com. Please give us some feedback. It's been delightful to be back. Let me know if you're liking the web page because we really want to start giving these web pages out there. You can bookmark it and we can add some extra information into it. So I'm going to say goodbye from Sarah, who's been brilliant helping with the chat and goodbye from myself and look forward to seeing you very soon. Take care of yourselves, everybody.